Okay, hello everybody. We're going to talk about the 80s and public policy during this lecture here. We're going to focus on some things and there's going to be things that I want you to kind of kind of look at and, and investigate a little bit. Now, if we talk about the 80s, right, the Reagan era, the Reagan years, um, we had the economic policies of Ronald Reagan, which was what we kind of come to have learned to be uh, supply-side economics or that trickle-down theory. Um, Inflation and unemployment were our biggest problems at that time. And, and uh, Bush, who uh, Bush Senior, who was uh, Reagan's vice president, originally ran against Reagan in the 1980 elections, and, and considered um, supply side economics to be voodoo economics, and kind of just the way he classified it, where you know you reduce taxes, you promote unrestricted free market activity, and you decrease the welfare state. Um, Reagan also busted the air traffic controllers union. That's what we'll, we'll we'll talk a little bit about that. And then Reagan also kind of focused on that really conservative ideology of reduced government spending, reducing federal income tax and capital gains tax, reducing regulation, and tightening the money supply to control that inflation. Uh, I always like to kind of make the illusion that Reagan and Clinton were considered to be Teflon presidents. And when we say Teflon presidents, usually, you know, anytime there was a scandal or something happened that was negative, it seemed to not affect their popularity that that much. Um, Reagan had something called the Iran-Contra affair. And what was happening in the Iran-Contra affair was that the United States was dealing arms to Iran and then funneling the profits for those um, for, from those sales to a um, anti-communist group in Nicaragua at the time called the Contras, who are fighting the Sandinista government. Um, unfortunately, this was illegal. We had something called the Bolin Amendment, which gave what which Congress um, strictly prohibited the funding of the Contras during that time. Um, the Democrats passed the Bolin Amendment, which restricted the activities of the CIA and the DOD in foreign conflicts. It was specifically aimed at Nicaragua, where, like we said, anti-communist Contras are battling, battling the, the, the Sandinista communist government. Uh, during Reagan's presidency, you know, with the cut, cutting of taxes um, and the increased spending on national defense caused us to go into a further deficit. Uh, we went from the, being the largest creditor nation in the world to the largest debtor in under eight years. And this was because taxes were cut, but spending wasn't cut. And that's, you know, a pretty simple thing to look at. Um, relations in the Middle East were already kind of strained. Uh, Iran and Iraq were in a bloody conflict. And at the same time, Iranian-backed terrorists were holding seven American hostages in Lebanon. Uh, Reagan delivered an ultimatum to his advisors, and he wanted to get these hostages home. Um, Reagan told his NSA uh, person, Robert McFarland, I want you to do whatever you have to do to get this done. Robert McFarland uh, argued that a deal with Iran would not only secure the release of the hostages, but also improve relations with Lebanon. Um, and providing the country with an ally in that region where it desperately needed one. And also, on top of that, the U.S. would secure funds that the CIA would se secretly direct to the Contra movement down in Nicaragua. Uh, the Lebanese newspaper Al Sharia first reported the arms deal between the U.S. and Iran. Reagan was already well into his second term, so this wouldn't really could potentially affect him at the ballot box. Um, by that time, the Americans had been uh, had uh, American 1,500 American missiles had been sold to Iran for 30 million dollars. Uh, three of the seven hostages were released, although the Iran-backed terrorist group that uh, there later took three more hostages. So it was kind of uh, really not effective. Uh, Attorney General Ed Meese uh, launched an investigation into the deal and found out out of that 30 million dollars that was generated in profit, they couldn't account for 18 million of that. So $18 million went missing, which is kind of alarming when you look at that. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North, who is now currently a right-wing figure, uh, president of the NRA, um, conservative radio talk show host, 
at that time was on the National Security Council. The National Security Council is a group of military individuals that give um, the president some advice on how to deal with foreign relations. Um, Nor said he, he made all of these um, uh, deals with the Contras in Nicaragua uh, under the direction of National Security Advisor Admiral John Poindexter, and he assumed that Reagan knew that this was going on. Uh, Oliver North was charged with 12 counts relating to conspiracy and making false statements to the government. He was convicted in his initial trial, but what eventually happened is his case was dismissed on a technicality. Admiral Poindexter was originally indicted on seven felonies and ultimately tried on five. He was found guilty on four, sentenced to two years in prison, although his convictions were later overturned. So I think we're kind of seeing a pattern here. Reagan was never charged... In 1992, this should say uh, George H.W. Bush. It's a typo. J George H.W. Bush, Reagan's vice president, <coughs> uh, was elected president in 1988, and he uh, pardoned, pardoned Casper Weinberger, who was a member of Reagan's administration involved in this. Uh, McFarland was charged with four counts of withholding information of Congress, which is a misdemeanor, two years probation, $20,000 fine. So... When we look at this, uh, you know, usually there wasn't that much that came came out of this whole scandal as far as punishments, and we can see it was kind of light. Okay, so, uh, you know, the 80s, you know, were definitely the Reagan era. You know, I want you to focus on Reaganomics and the Iran-Contra affair. We talked a little bit more about some of the things Reagan did in his own presidency. Now let's kind of look over and focus on, on public policy. Um you know, here in California, there's some things that we have to, to maybe deal with as far as uh, property tax values. We've talked about Prop 13. We talked about Melarus. Melarus is an additional property tax for people that live in special designated areas that for 25 uh, years you have to pay an additional eighth of a tenth, eighth tenth of a percent um, in property tax. Uh, that money is used to fund schools, police, fire, and so on. Now, there's also the question of vouchers. Should we give vouchers to people, you know, use this tax dollar money and give it to people who want to stick their kids in private school? That's a whole other kind of public policy issue that, that we're not really going to get into, but it's something that's out there. As far as education, we have about 6.3 million students here in California. 53% are Hispanic and uh, 1.4 million are English learners. So, obviously, we have um, kind of a... a, a what's the best way to put it um maybe a bit of a an issue with uh you know test scores not being as up to par as some other states this might be due to a lot of people here are learning english as a second language and you know when you have english language learners and you have parents that are home that aren't uh english speakers it might be difficult for them to help with homework and so on um we're below national average in spending and above in poverty. Um, and we have the lowest percent in the U.S. of English spoken at home. So one interesting statistic is before all this pandemic happened, and I'm not quite sure what's going to happen you know, with the dwindling tax revenues and a lot of people not being in the, out of people being out of work. Um, California schools spend about $10,300 a year on K-12 through students. Uh, that's about $2,000 less than what the national average is. And in comparison, now, well, this might not be a, a, a really good comparison or a really sound comparison, but if we look at prisoners, uh, the state of California spends about $75,000 a year on to house a prisoner, right? So, you know, obviously, you know, prison guards have 24-7 jobs. This includes medical care. Um, recreation, education as well. So I can understand why the figures might, and this is again 365, 365 days a year while the school year is 180 days a year. So it's it's an interesting stat to look at, even though it might not, it might be a little bit fallacious. Um, um, and maybe, you know, trying to practice on a little bit of that, you know, the fallacy that in this comparison, but I always think it's a good thing, figure to look at. Now, when we talk about spending and some of the money that schools use, um, as you can see, if we look at the orange bar on the left, coupled with the kind of the 
light green and the dark blue. I don't know what color that is. Um, the benefits color. So if you look at the spending, 80, what, 2% of that is on um, teacher salaries and benefits and administrator salaries and staff and all that stuff. Um, so we can see where most of our district spending goes to. And books of supplies, you know, with anything, you know, you know, I mean, you guys have come to the realize that realization that once you get a book or once you get a textbook, it's already outdated once it's printed, right? So uh, I bet if we went and look at local high schools and tried to um, look at some of their texts, they're probably running on some er very old textbooks. Um, so. The state budget included in 2018 to 2019 included $132 billion in general fund resources for K through 12. And overall spending for California public schools is about $193 billion. Um, the funding sources for these are, you know, the state, our state tax, property tax, and other local sources um, in the federal government. So state tax, you know, money that we get taken out of our paycheck. Property taxes, remember that whole Prop 13, 1% of your social value, um, and the federal government also contributes money. So when we talk about higher education, which a lot of you guys might be interested in, obviously, is the 2020 budget for the California State University system right now is about $7.8 billion. The UC system is $9.7 billion, and California Community Colleges is $10 billion. Now, another really contentious issue here, in the, in, especially in California, is water, right? So, we first started to see water projects back in 1919 when um, Gener uh, Lieutenant Robert Marshall of the U.S. Geological Service wanted to transport water from Sacramento River to the San Joaquin Valley and then move it through the, the Hepachete Mountains into Southern California, right? Um, we had the Central Valley Act, which was a bond pass that was approved by voters that, you know, started to fund these aqueduct projects. So our water supply comes from two sources, right? Surface water and water that travels or water that travels or, or, um, water that is pumped from the ground. So, you know, rainfalls, that is a water supply for us and groundwater where people dig a well and well out water, that's another ground supply. Um. And then we also have a small amount of water that is used and taken from the ocean where it's desalinated and uh, it's been purified for water. And there's some examples of water boards. Now, one question about water here in the United States and specifically in California is who owns it? I'm going to post a documentary that's on, on Netflix. I'm going to try to find it on YouTube as well. So you guys, if you, for those of you that don't have Netflix, um, don't have to buy a subscription. It's not anything I'm going to have on the exam or anything, but um, it talks about water rights. And usually water rights in California is a very contentious issue. And the water is, um, the question is, who owns it? Should it be a public ownership or should private industries be able to own water? It's a whole, you know, quandary. Now let's talk about federal government and federal spending. Um, and remember, these are all going to be numbers that you know I've have that were put into place before the pandemic. So um, right now, federal spending remains basically about twenty percent of our gross domestic product. Um, it was twenty eight percent in two thousand nine, and it was twenty one percent in two thousand and nineteen. Out of that money, 60% of all federal spending are based off of entitlements, whether it's Social Security, um, Medicare, things that we pay into and that we're going to be entitled to when we qualify, right? And there's kind of been some arguments on whether or not or how we should cap entitlements, but it's more of an ideological view on how the welfare state and programs that are generated through entitlements are maybe pared down or cut out or even increased depending on your ideology, right? This is an example of federal spending. Now, currently in the United States, we have a $23 trillion deficit. 
That is an astounding figure, meaning the United States as a whole owes $23 trillion to different creditors throughout the world. International investors hold about 20% of the national debt. And when we talk about GDP, GDP is usually used to measure how well or how prosperous the country is. Um, and there's a formula. We're not going to get too in-depth in that. That's going to be more of a political science 101 class thing that you'll talk about if you take that class. Or maybe a macro or microeconomics class. So the way the government funds itself is, is it funds itself through individual income taxes, Social Security taxes, remember, we have Social Security taxes that are deducted from our paycheck. We pay half. Our employer pays half. So generally it's about, say, I think it's roughly 8% of your income. You pay 4% and your employer pays 4%. So you need to kind of understand that. Um, corporate taxes, they only pay about 9%. Um, and on Social Security taxes, they are aggressive. So each person is kind of on a flat number. And they're imposed on the first $132,900 of wage income. So once a person makes more than $133,000 in a year, they don't have to pay Social Security tax anymore. Here's a little bit of what federal spending um, was generated from and where the federal government collected the revenues. Um, individual income tax was about 50%. Payroll tax was 36 And then we can see the others like... Um, excise tax, corporate income tax. Um, I don't think they have uh, capital gains. They might have lumped, lumped capital gains under other. Capital gains are taxes that people make off of dividends of stock. So if I buy a stock, say I buy Apple stock and it's worth $10. I have one share. That means I have one share in the company and it's worth $10. Then the value of Apple goes up, and now my stock is worth $20. So that $10 profit that I'm, I'm making or that dividend that Apple might pay me out of that um, is uh, taxable. And it's taxable through something called capital gains. Here is where our budget was in 2018. As you can see, Social Security makes up the biggest part of the budget. <coughs> Social Security and Medicare. Um, a lot of people think the fence is the biggest portion of the budget, but it's not. It's Social Security and Medicare. Something that I want you guys to understand. Now, I'm not going to try to act like I know what the federal income tax rate is and how that is all generated. It's a very complicated process, but income is taxed at seven separate brackets or seven separate rates, and you are a part of or you fall into a certain bracket, which the government can tax you anywhere from 10 to 37 percent of your um, of your income. Uh, corporations are taxed at 21 percent, but they have a bunch of exemptions that might cause your tax liability to go down. Um, so that's why we see corporations don't give as much tax dollars as the American people. And we talked about capital gains, um, what those were, and they're only currently taxed at 15 to 20 percent. Now, another way that the government makes a lot of money is through or generates revenue is through regulation, right? Regulations are things that we have out there that are put into place to discourage some type of maybe illegal activity or pollution or worker exploitation or whatever. Um, so they generate the revenue. We have the activist regulators here. So uh, the equal Employment Opportunity Commission is a good example of one. So if you're ever discriminated against in a workplace um, or in housing or whatever, you can make a, a complaint with the EEOC or even with the state and they will investigate it. If they find out that you are violating some type of law or something they can or regulation, they can definitely find you. OSHA is the same thing. OSHA is the Occupation Safety and Health Administration. They dictate whether or not, um, you know, things are, are safe for people to work. You know, we have regulations that we have to follow at work. And if there's an accident and uh, OSHA is investigating it, there might be fines or, or, or things called corrective actions that may come out of it. So um, if somebody is... Uh, working on a big project and they fall and they're killed or they're hurt, OSHA might come in and investigate why, what safety measures 
would imp were ignored or what could have been put into place to help avoid those type of situations. But one of the more famous um, regulators are the Environmental Protection Agency. So we know pollution, clean air, clean water are all regulated. And if companies violate these regulations, they can be fined. In fact, um, remember the BP spill, the British Petroleum spill that happened a couple, a few years ago. Uh, British Petroleum was was uh, eventually fined $50 million um, for the spill that happened. So that's a good example of regulations. Now, some people argue that regulations hamper businesses. So when we have a regulation, you guys kind of understand that regulation is actually paid for by three different ways. So if we have a, and this is just an example, say we put the regulation that or the law that you know everybody has to earn fifteen dollars an hour minimum wage here in in the United States. So what's that? What's going to happen? Who's going to pay the increase in costs? Businesses who have to maybe raise their prices. Employees who you know might not get as many hours now because they have to maybe work into the budget ways to accommodate the $15 an hour jobs. Maybe there might be less jobs available out there. And ultimately the consumer, just think about that. Anytime there is a, you know, a regulation put into place, eventually we are the ones that are going to pay for it. So if we have you know, a $15 hour minimum wage um, and a small business has to implement that minimum wage, then, you know, in order to still maintain viability and to generate a profit, businesses might use, might increase prices in, in order to accommodate that uh, increase in cost to them. <coughs> so ultimately, it's passed on to the consumer. This is estimated to be about $2 trillion worth of regulations in 2019. So the government has received about $2 trillion dollars. In revenue which is about 11% of the GDP so I mean do we need to deregulate um, a lot of these industries um, people well, some of the complaints about excessive regulations are at increased cost to business and consumers which we just talked about hampers innovation and productivity if uh, places don't have extra money um, they can't maybe innovate their business or reinvest into their business uh, reduces competition and doesn't weigh the cost of complying against the benefits of society. How can we p fix the system? Should we privatize a lot of industries? Privatization is taking the, the duty of a government, uh, maybe service, and passing it on to somebody in the private sector. So one good example of privatization here, and especially in San Diego, is trash, trash and sewer. So um, the trash is collected, and it's actually collected by an independent company. And what they do is, and they take it to the city or the county dump. Um, what the, the city and county has done is they've solicited bids for, for companies to do this service. Usually there's a belief that you know they can do it more efficiently and less costly. And uh, should we go toward that? Are there industries, and I want you to think about this, are there industries that you believe could possibly be privatized. Something that the government does that you might want to have the private sector to do. Lastly, let's look at this. This is the Marine Court uh, traffic data. So I'm actually going to um, open this. And we'll take a quick look. Oops. Okay, if you look at this, this is 2020 traffic um, fines. So this is another way the state of California um, generates revenue. If you look at this, uh, go down and look at speeding. So if you look at this, uh, speeding more than 26 miles an hour over 65 uh, mile per hour speed limit we see the base fine is a uh, hundred dollars but if you look at it with all the fight with the cost and regulation attached to it 
your final cost is going to be $489 if you get a speeding ticket. You're going over 26 miles an hour. Um, 1 to 15, it's a $237 fine. Uh, 16 to 25 is $366. So you can see, um, you know, it can be cost effective. I mean, cost prohibitive. In, in, in you see that uh, the government generates a lot of money by this. Uh, let's see if I can find disabled parking. That one. A uh, violation of disabled parking privileges, you could face a fine of about $1,100. So I don't know if that's using a placard illegally. It's not really um, defined. Uh, or is it. Um, parking in a stall. Look at the one right below it. Parking in a space for an electric charging. Um, $489. So all these fines that we see and that we get, um, it's actually money that goes back into the government to help run the government. So another source of revenue. And this is part of regulation. Okay. So that's going to be that um, for what we talk about right now. Um, we'll go ahead and stop it here, and then if you have any questions, just let me know. Okay, thank you.